Why do you reckon that is? Why do modern dogs need to be trained? Is it because of those changed expectations I was talking about before? And yes, I think it is, partly, right? But also I think we've got different dogs. If you go back 50 years or you go back 100 years, we had this enormous population of what some people call village dogs. You know, these are dogs that nobody bred. They just turned up out of nowhere. They bred themselves because we didn't desex our pets in those days. So they just hung around. They bred when they could. They lived on the streets. They, you, know, you, you adopted one and took it home for a while. And there was this big population of these dogs. And they've been selected for thousands of years to live with humans comfortably. If they didn't, we killed them. Somebody shot them, hit them over the head with a 4B2. They were out of the gene pool. Right? The good ones got to survive. And then we had this teeny weeny population of purebred dogs and nobody I knew when I was a kid had a purebred dog. Unheard of. But where I lived, which was a working class suburb, no purebred dogs. Everyone just had these village dogs. They just hung around. They just You got one from the friend down the street or the neighbour. And then we looked at these purebred dogs you know, on, on posters and swap cards and thought, oh, aren't they wonderful? Wish I had one of them. We'll never be able to afford one of them how things have changed. So now we've got a really small population of village dogs, practically none. You never see dogs living without human contact anymore in Victoria, and we, you know, hardly ever. So we control our dog breeding absolutely now because we got better at it. We got better at desexing them. Everybody desexes their pets now. We got better at containing them. There are no village dogs. We've got an enormous population of purebred dogs. In our surveys, 40%, sometimes up to 70% of people own purebred dogs. So much, much bigger. Everyone's got the perfect dog, the perfect family, the perfect dog. Because we're middle class now, we can afford it. So we all get a purebred dog. And we also have this population of profit-bred dogs. Dogs that are bred because there's money in dog breeding these days. There never used to be because everybody could get a dog for nothing. You just got one from the free-to-good home. Can't do that anymore. So now there's money in breeding dogs and we get all these designer dogs that fit that, that population. So we have these, and the selection pressures on those dogs, if we go back there, they're different. So the village dogs bred because they could, they got to survive. The purebred dogs and the profit bred dogs, we're choosing what to breed them, what to breed them for. And often it's um, sale or show ring or all those sort of things that we breed dogs for. And we're, we're not selecting heavily enough for behaviour. Adding to the problem, most dog owners don't know anything about dogs. Right? And that's true. So, you know, everybody used to live with a whole lot of dogs. It doesn't happen anymore. We surveyed 250 young adults and we gave them pictures of dogs that looked like that and we said, what, is this, what breed is this dog an example of? How familiar are you with it? And what do you think about it in terms of a pet dog, in terms of being fearful, in terms of being aggressive? We asked them 14 different questions. What we found out is that people could identify some of the highly recognisable dogs, like Dalmatians. Right? Everybody could name a Dalmatian. Yeah, good on you, Sally. Right? and Labradors and German Shepherds, but some of the other breeds nobody could recognise. These are young adults, remember, so these are not doggy people, these are uh, uh, psychology students. When we asked them how familiar they were with the different breeds, turns out they're not. Right? So even people who could recognise them, their familiarity score, and this is on a scale from zero to four, is less than one for a whole lot of the breeds and less than two for all of them, the main familiarity scores. So even though they could identify them, they said, I don't know anything about this breed. They were quite happy to tell us that. And you'd expect that. You know, these 18-year-old, 19-year-old teenagers, how could they know a lot about dog breeds? Even lower for those who couldn't identify them, as you'd expect, and the figures are really, really, really low, surprisingly low. On the other hand, they had quite strong views about what the dogs were good for. Right? So I don't know anything about this dog, but I think it would make a great pet. Or, I don't know anything about this dog, but I think it would make a terrible pet. And this is showing the ones up that end, they would recommend, and the ones down this end, they wouldn't. Right? I didn't fudge these results. This is, a, this is what happened, right? So, so even though they don't know anything about them, they've got quite strong stereotypes about different breeds. Right? This is the one for dog, dogs that are generally fearful. Right? And again, so the ones up that end are the fearful ones and the ones down this end are the non-fearful ones. Does that not prove to you that the average dog person doesn't know anything? Right? And yet they have these strong views about dogs and of course that's going to get them into trouble when they go to get a dog. Right? So we need education to deal with that a little bit. The other thing is public perceptions about dogs have changed. Who's timing this? How am I going for time? Okay, cool. So another problem, hey? You started a little bit late. Yes, I did. That's all right. Tammy can shorten hers up. <laughs> <laughs> so another problem is our public perceptions about dogs have changed. When I think about kids and dogs, these are the images I get in my brain. 
right? Kids and dogs belong together, go everywhere together, get down and dirty at the beach, all that. Other people in the community think about kids and dogs, that's what pops into their head, right? These are not good images to have in your head when you think about kids and dogs. And we have a whole public out there, that's what they think. They think that because of media hype, they think that because they only ever hear the bad things, right? But that's what they think. We have other cultures in Australia now who have no experience with growing up with dogs and we have to, as a community of breeders, people who care about dogs, we've got to deal with these public perceptions because they're making the rules, right? Now, of course, it's not true that dogs are dangerous. That's just not true at all. It's just garbage, right? So Janice Bradley, this is a really good book for those of you looking for ammunition when you're trying to convince people that dogs aren't dangerous. I wrote a book called Dogs Bite, but Balloons and Slippers are More Dangerous. This is American data, of course. Um, but she found out that kids under 10 are more likely to be killed by playground equipment or balloons than dogs. Right? More likely to be killed in an accident involving a bucket. They're pretty dangerous, those buckets. They jump out at you. Right? <laughs> They're more likely, way more likely, like 90 times more likely to be killed by friends and family. Right? And we, when I think of families, I don't have images of torn up kids. Right? Dogs are less dangerous than most items of furniture or footwear. Slippers kill more kids than dogs. Right? And kids are far more likely to be injured playing any kind of sport. That doesn't mean that dogs don't hurt kids occasionally. Of course they do. In Victoria, the rate of hospitalisation for dog bite injury is, is not good and it, you know, it could be going up. So the most recent stats, that we've gone up from 8.3 per 100,000 in 1999 to 9.5 per 100,000. So it's a little bit of an increase. Whether that's going to continue, we don't know. Okay. But dogs cause about one fatality annually in Victoria. Some years, stingrays beat that. Right? So it's not, it's not that dogs are out there killing kids, it's just that okay, it makes media when they do, as it should. And again, going back to all of our research we've ever done, most dog owners love their dogs and most uh, uh, love them. Whatever kind of dog they are, think they're terrific, don't have behavioural problems. So what do we do about this? Right? We have these problems, we have perceptions, we have different dogs. I think number one is always education, always. Right? We need to educate. We need to educate potential dog owners. You know, these kids who know absolutely nothing about different breeds should know something about breeds. Our, um, our responsible pet ownership program is terrific. We should all be supporting that and programs like it. We need to get information into schools. We need to get information into um, maternal health care centres. We need to get information everywhere. The community, when they think of kids and dogs, need to have good images in their head. So we need to get potential dog owners, we need to get the general community and we need to educate media and politicians. And we do that not by getting mad at them when they report bad stories, because bad stories happen, but by flooding them with good stories. Right? What have you done with your dog that's great this week? Make sure people know about it. Get the positive stories out there so that they outweigh the negative ones. What else should we do? I think we need to be much more transparent in what we're doing. So I think we need to identify and, and publicise honestly our breeding goals. If you're breeding for something, whether it is confirmation or behaviour, tell people about it and be honest about it. And this is really difficult because when I ring up any breeder in Australia and ask them what they're breeding for, they'll tell me it's temperament. And if I, you know, and people interpret that differently. It's really hard to figure out who's telling the truth and who's not and what they know about it. We'll talk about that more in a minute. I think we need to develop objective measures of desirable and undesirable traits. And Tammy's going to talk to you about her project, which is starting to do that. So just as we do herding instinct tests and you know, retrieving tests, we try to identify dogs that are good at certain behaviours. I think we should be doing that for companion dogs. So we should be looking at what behaviours do we want in our companion dogs? How can we measure that? Once you can measure it, you can manage it and breed towards it. At the moment, we can't measure that very well. So every breeder will tell me that their dogs are good at this, good at that, good at that. But I don't know if that's true or not because they've told me rather than an objective person. We need to acknowledge our limitations and there are lots of limitations in dog breeding. It's hard to breed dogs. But we can't predict how our puppies will turn out. We can breed 15 generations of dogs who look like that and then get one that does that. <laughs> you know? And it's really hard to get it right. Really hard because genetics is so messy. Mike's going to talk about that. Um, puppy temperament tests. We all use puppy temperament tests, so I will test all my puppies and I'll match them to owners as best I can. As a breeder, I'm pretty sure that that works really well. As a scientist, I know that it doesn't. Right? <laughs> all the literature out there, anybody who's actually done the work and tested it, puppy temperament tests aren't very good. Right? They're not very good. 
We're lucky because most dogs are perfectly good, so whatever you do with them, they're going to work out okay. Right? But we need to get better at that. We need to get better at predicting things. Gene pools are limited, and this is particularly the case with purebred dogs. This is another one of my dogs, Riff Raff, who's the mother of these two. Riff Raff's a legato, right? one of not very 